Summer is right around the corner and I bet many of you are planning for vacation rather than for that Monday team meeting. Hmm. How are you going to get to your destination? If by car, what car will it be? Today I prepared a list of 10 cars with large boots which I would take on vacation. And a bonus at the end, 3 cars which I would definitely not. <laughs> Let's go! As usual, please bear in mind that specifications mentioned are accurate on the day of writing the script, which in this case is late May 2023. If you're watching this later, I doubt anything became cheaper. <laughs> and it's more than likely some versions may no longer be available, especially diesel engines. Anyway, for this listicle, I adopted two criteria. Objective, at least 500 liters boot capacity, and subjective, would I like to drive this car for hundreds of kilometers? I'm sure everyone has their own subjective favorite and feel free to let me know what car you're thinking about, what you're taking on vacation and why. Let me know. Anyway, we start off with Audi Q5, boot volume 510 liters. With current prices of fuel and the state of EV rapid charging infrastructure, nothing beats a diesel. Audi Q5 with a 2 liter 190 horsepower diesel, 7 speed S Tronic Quattro all wheel drive. A good choice. 7 liters per 100 kilometers in a combined cycle is achievable, so unless you plan to set speed records on a trip to the seaside or tow up to 2,400 kilograms, the trip should be reasonably cheap. With nearly 20 centimeters of ground clearance, you'll park anywhere, just be careful with the rims. The boot volume is 510 liters. There are pockets on the sides for small items, there is also an elastic strap to hold something upright. There are two shopping bag hooks and levers to fold down the second row seat backs. Depending on the configuration, there may be a subwoofer and a mini spare under the floor, but no room to stow away the cargo cover. There is plenty of legroom and headroom in the back, although due to the massive tunnel, the middle seat is reserved only for younger passengers. Ice fix anchor points are only on side seats. There is an armrest with drink holders. The middle section of the backrest folds down, allowing you to carry, for example, skis and two adult passengers in the back. Rear passengers have a third zone climate control and a 12 volt outlet. If drinks don't fit in the cup holders, door pockets are large. The cockpit is simple and elegant. If you like soft touch trim materials, Audi's cockpit is soft to touch from top to the bottom. Everything is solid and legible and easy to use. The Audi Q5 is well soundproofed. This is thanks to both low drag coefficient and sound insulation underneath the vehicle. This is just a pleasant car for getting from A to B on a daily basis. It's not particularly exciting, but that's not its job. It's supposed to be comfortable and stress-free, and that's exactly what it is. But if you don't want an SUV, what would you say to a BMW 3 Series Touring? With the boot volume of just 500 liters, the 3 Estate barely makes it on this list, but it's got one of the best design boots out there. Need to fold down the second row seats and stow the cover somewhere? There's room for it in the storage compartment under the floor and not only for the cargo cover, but also for the net which you can use to separate the cargo area from the passenger area. Deeper still, there's a second flat storage compartment where you can carry, for example, a folding shopping basket or something. The shopping bag hook is only one and it feels somewhat flimsy. Now, I've got a question for you. In your opinion, is quick access through the opening rear window something you'd genuinely use, or is it a Skoda-style, simply clever gimmick to give the media something to talk about? Drop me a comment. Now, under the bonnet of the 3 Series, you can fit up to a 6-cylinder petrol or a 6-cylinder diesel. Now, I understand 2 liters is probably more affordable. I'd skip the plug-in hybrid if you want any usable space in the boot. Up front, the BMW OS8 is here, but fortunately, physical buttons remain on the steering wheel. In the rear, room for two people rather than three. Driving on the motorway is easy thanks to driver assistance systems. That way, you get to those fun roads rested and ready to have some fun, as long as the passengers don't mind. For drivers who value comfort, I suggest the Citroën C5X with a 545-liter boot. 
This is one of the few cars in which my gear case fits on its long side upright and it's still possible to close the hatch. Electric tailgate is only on the top trim. The plug-in hybrid gets a smaller boot. There's a styrofoam insert with compartments underneath the floor. It accommodates the cargo cover. No shopping bag hooks, but there are levers to fold the backrests in the second row. And they are spring-loaded, so you don't have to reach in and push them. With the second row backrests folded, the cargo volume increases to 1640 liters. There is good legroom and headroom in the back, but it's dark and the panoramic roof is only optional on the highest equipment version. Lighter upholstery is also an option. The cockpit is elegant and spacious. The graphics on the displays in front of the driver and on the center display are unsophisticated, yet simple and everything works. There are buttons on the steering wheel. There are also buttons and dials to operate the air conditioning. There are USB ports, a wireless charger, wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. The C5X is well soundproofed. The seats are comfortable too. Also, the suspension with progressive hydraulic bump stops makes the ride cushy. Adaptive cruise control is standard even on the basic trim. Higher equipment versions get lane keeping assist and it works properly, so you won't get tired on the road. Ford Focus may be all the car you need, an honest estate with 608 liter boot capacity. With the backrest folded, there are more than 1650 liters. There are handles to release the spring loaded second row backrests. Thanks to the double floor, we get a flat cargo space and you can pull a strap to release the cargo cover and it just slides toward you. This is probably the best cargo cover removal and installation I have encountered so far. The cargo cover fits perfectly under the floor. There is also a movable partition under the floor, which allows you to arrange the space better. The floor can be placed in two positions, either so it acts as a partition or it rests against the backs of the seats in the second row, which allows you to make full use of the bottom of the boot. There are also two decent shopping bag hooks and a 12 volt outlet. For road trips, I recommend the diesel 1.5 liter, 120 horsepower, six speed manual. You'll be asking the gas station attendant to help you to fill up because it's been so long since your last visit, you forgot how to do it. Other than that, there's decent space in the back, classic cockpit, there's room for small items. The door pockets are lined with soft material. I would suggest AGR seats if you have the option. In this test car, I complained about poor soundproofing, but viewers assure me that it is much better in higher equipment versions. Large boot, economical engine, comfortable seats. Well, maybe you just can't have everything, can you? You can in a Kia Pro Seed, which has a 594 liter boot. The Pro Seed used to be a three door hatch, now it's a shooting brake or a coupe estate. Due to the falling roofline and more slanted rear window than in the regular estate, the Pro Seed's boot is about 30 liters smaller. A cargo area arrangement system can be ordered. There are also shopping bag hooks and levers to fold the rear seats. There are also storage compartments under the floor. In one of them, you can stow the cargo cover. There's even an electrically operated tailgate as an option. The second row backrest splits 40-20-40, so you can carry two passengers and longer items such as skis at the same time. There is no diesel, but there is also no PHEV, so the boot is large regardless of the engine variant. If you like it hotter, there is a 200 horsepower version, 1.6 liter. And if you're a less spirited driver, the 160 horsepower 1.5 liter will do. There's also a 1 liter petrol engine, but maybe let's leave it for smaller Kia models. Compared to the station wagon, the suspension is lower and stiffer, and the steering is quite direct. The interior is very practical, just as it used to be in Volkswagens years ago. Get one of these before it disappears from the market. I don't know which generation and which facelift Mazda CX-5 is currently on, but there is a 541 liter boot and if you can still find a non-electrified 2 liter petrol, you'll have a car for years. Boot volume may vary depending on equipment, but all versions have more than 500 liters. Regardless of the equipment version, the floor splits and can be lowered by a couple of centimeters, all of it or only half, allowing you to slide one part under the other, thus gaining open access to the spare wheel well. No shopping bag hooks, but there are levers to fold each of the three parts of the 40-20-40 split backrest. 
When the second row of backrests are folded, the boot capacity increases to 1620 liters. The rear doors open very wide, which can be important when you have to get those kids in the child seats. Isofix mounting points are on the side seats, but not on the front passenger seat. The doors cover the sills and there are generous pockets in the doors. Up front, a sleek, easy to use cockpit, comfortable seats. Everything is in its place. Soundproofing is good, visibility so-so. Uh, the suspension dampens bumps perfectly. On top of that, the whole car is well screwed together. So the CX-5's travel comfort can indeed be compared with premium cars. The driving is engaging enough to keep you from falling asleep behind the wheel, but not overwhelming. So everyday driving should be stress-free. But if you want something with a premium badge, check out the new Mercedes-Benz GLC with a 620 liter boot. Unfortunately, a good portion of this cargo space is under the floor. Take it into consideration when packing. Good news, cargo cover fits under the floor. Above the floor is about 450 liters. That's more or less how much remains in the plug-in hybrid version, where the traction battery lands under the floor. And there is only a small storage compartment near the very edge of the boot that's just enough to fit a charging cable. In the boot, there are shopping bag hooks and a 12-volt outlet and buttons to release the second door backrest. By the way, the second row backrest can be set upright so that you can make full use of the cargo space, for example, to carry cardboard boxes when moving. The tailgate can be opened and closed with gesture, fob or with buttons on the lid. The doors do not cover the sills. Optional side steps are available. While they give the GLC a more off-roady look, they do not make getting in any easier. The door pockets are deep. Legroom and headroom are plentiful. The backrest splits 40-20-40. Up front, we get the new generation MBUX, which means operating everything on the display or with touch buttons on the steering wheel. The position behind the steering wheel is comfortable. Here we have memory for the seats and the mirrors and the steering wheel. These can be stored with a press of a button or in a driver profile. Under the bonnet, it's four cylinders only now. Uh, fortunately, you can still order a diesel and on a long trip, it's the best choice. Unfortunately, the 220D, which should use about five and a half liters of diesel per 100 kilometers combined, seems to be using closer to eight. On the plus side, the car is well soundproofed. Even at motorway speeds, there is barely any engine or wind noise. The handling is not very engaging, but that's not why you choose a Mercedes over, say, a BMW. When selecting options, I would skip anything that might stiffen the suspension. Focus on comfort. Also, the 360 camera system is excellent. Nissan X-Trail in a 5-seater configuration has 575 liters boot, and if you go for the E-Force Hybrid all-wheel drive, you get surprisingly good off-road abilities, within reason, of course, otherwise you'll be looking for a tractor. Most of these 575 liters are above the floor, which is good. The storage compartment under the floor is shallow and not very useful, which is less good. The floor is a two-piece job and half of it can serve as a partition. Unfortunately, there are no additional hooks on this part of the floor, like you would have on a Volvo or a Range Rover. If you run out of boot space in the standard configuration, the second row seats slide and have adjustable backrest angle. There is plenty of room in the back and in the front as well. And in the front, you see how luxurious the new X-Trail is. Most of the controls are physical. The seats are very comfortable. With its unique combination of hybrid and all-wheel drive, the X-Trail manages to be engaging to drive, although I would focus on the comfort. Unfortunately, Nissan's hybrid powertrain is not particularly economical. Still, I would take the X-Trail on a long road trip. Peugeot 408 is another lift-back coupe crossover of sorts with quite a large boot at 536 liters. What's the 408 all about and how it fits in the Peugeot range is discussed at length in my review of the 408. Now, channel members will get to see it in a couple of days and everyone else in a couple of weeks. So, you know, become a member. <clears throat> the boot is so deep that my large gear case fits on the long side. 536 liters boot capacity is for the petrol powered cars. 508 liters if you go for the optional focal audio system. PHEVs get 471 and 454 liters respectively. 
There are shopping bag hooks, which is unusual for a French car, electrically operated tailgate only on the top GT trim version. In the rear, there are large door pockets and cup holders in the armrest, and there's a ski hatch as well. The backrest splits 4060 with Isofix points only on the two side seats. There is an air vent and two USB ports. The floor is not flat. The 408's cockpit is mostly the same as in the 308. I don't like that it takes a few clicks to turn the heating seats on or change the temperature settings, but there's not much I can do about it. What's more, when I use Android Auto, I have to go back to Peugeot's system to control the above functions. The seats are very good. Regardless of the equipment version, you can choose a driver's seat certified by AGR, which is the German Association for a Healthy Back. And it's well worth it. The 130 horsepower, 1.2 liter three cylinder engine variant is surprisingly economical. Dynamics are spoiled by the automatic transmission, but once you learn that there is no point making sudden maneuvers, you drive even more economically. This engine is enough to cruise at 140 km per hour. At the same time, for such a small engine powering such a large car, the interior is surprisingly quiet. The promised fuel economy uh, should be about 6 liters per 100 km in combined cycle, but that's optimistic. 7 to 8 liters is more realistic. Volvo V60, 529 liters in Scandinavian design, and you can still get a diesel, at least in some markets. My favorite feature of the Volvo boot is the folding partition. Simple and useful in everyday situation. While in the five-seat configuration, the Volvo V60 boot is one of the largest in the segment, with the seats in the second row folded, it's just 1,441 liters. At least there are buttons to fold the seats. Also, you can choose a spare wheel, but then you will lose most of the underfloor storage and the boot capacity drops below 500 liters. There's plenty of legroom in the back. Headroom, not so much. A large tunnel runs through the middle, at least there's a wide armrest because nobody wants to sit in the middle. The interior of the V60 is similar to that we've seen in many Volvos of the past few years. I like the Volvo interiors. This one here still has the old infotainment. New cars get Android Automotive, which I have ranted about at length in other videos. The steering is direct. The suspension is stiff, so don't go crazy with the wheel size. The seats are supposed to be a marvel of ergonomics, but uh, they're a little too hard for me. For what it's worth, the Volvo has great driver assistance systems, which makes long drives on motorways and dual carriageways stress-free. And a bonus, three cars I wouldn't want to road trip in. I would not go on a road trip in an Alfa Romeo Stelvio, as great as it is on twisty roads I need to drive to get to those twisty roads first, and on the motorway everything in a Stelvio irritates me, starting with the driver assistance features and ending with some creaking noise from the back seat. Dacia Jogger. Now this car is so bad, I seriously considered if I can get it to go fast enough to make sure that if I crash, at least I'll die on the spot. And last but not least is the Mercedes-Benz EQS. This liftback with a 600 liters boot is a showcase for Mercedes's approach to electromobility, not necessarily in a way Mercedes may have wished. Stay tuned for my EQE review where I talk more about it. And what's your favorite car for long vacation drives and why? Let me know in the comment section below. I post listicles every last Friday of the month. If you have an idea what I should make a list about next, drop me a comment below. Maybe it will be the topic of one of the future videos. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, join me every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time. And don't forget to subscribe and like this video as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.